Um, earliest musical influences would have been uh, my parents' record collection. Um, my parents got married at the beginning of the 50s, so I was about three or four years old when rock and roll arrived. Um, the heyday sort of 55 up to 60. And so I would hear the records. In fact, I used to be the DJ. My mum would let me put the 78s or the 45s on and I could tell what the records were just by looking at the colour of the label. So I knew the difference between Little Richard and Elvis before I knew anything else. Um, and then uh, uh, piano lessons, which I hated um, from the age of about eight. Uh, I really hated them. Uh, couldn't see any point uh, in what I was being told to play. It had no resonance uh, whatsoever. Um, was, it all, was it cla classical mainly? Classical and sort of, uh, I don't know, I was about to say mid-romantic indifference. Uh, tunes that uh, didn't seem to make any sense. Then I managed to convince my parents to let me play at least um, hits of the day and or uh, that was the era of big musicals like um, Oklahoma, South Pacific, um, and where lots of uh, Hammerstein and Richard Rogers wrote some great songs that became hits. So songs from Broadway musicals became movies, um, West Side Story and all this kind of thing. And then they in turn became hits. And so when I started to play those, um, I was playing contemporary, well in my mind it seemed like contemporary stuff. Um, but even that wasn't enough, I lost interest and kind of moved away from the piano. But everything changed in uh, December 1963 for my 12th birthday. My mum took me to see the Beatles as a birthday present. Wow. Um, and that really altered everything because all of a sudden I could see, feel the power of the live performance and of something that felt the, that I could use, or not use, but uh, belong to. Whereas the other stuff felt like it was other people's music. Um, so from 1963 onwards, I became a dedicated guitar player. And uh, that's where the interest in music really kicked off. And you start off with um, your schoolboy friends just messing around, playing. Then you find out that, in fact, a couple of your mates are actually better at football than they are at being uh, playing music. Yeah, uh, which is a real shame when you find you get disappointed in the fact that they can't actually put two chords together, and um, I could. So then I had to move on quickly to find mates who were better at music than they were at football. And it's funny um, once you find people who can play really well, and see it, your peer group can grow quite quickly. Um, and you get really good friends because you all have a shared passion. So I spent the, the end, second half of the 60s looking for those kind of people. And so then, is that when you, th how old were you then? Like? Uh, 16, 17. Uh, and and you already knew you wanted to do music? No, um, because it was still considered a very risky thing. And I, uh, uh, although my parents said I shouldn't, um, I kind of felt that I should nod towards having a real job. I decided I wasn't going to go to uh, college. I bitterly regret that now, actually. I should have done it. Um, I could have studied history at Oxford, um, but at the time, this was 1968, everything was, it was all too exciting, too much was going on. And the idea of amazing time. Yeah, it was. And, um, and so instead of going to Oxford to study history, I went to the Isle of Wight Festival. <laughs> and I know, that choice seems quite a good one. In, in looking back, but at the time, I was thinking that's probably quite risky. Um, but my, Actually, my parents didn't care uh, um, about having kind of regular life or a regular job. I did join the civil service when I left school after my A-levels um, just to have uh, some money. Um, but I was in a, a semi-pro band at this point and they would pick me up from the office and I would get into a transit van and change into my loon pants and, and hippie gear <laughs> and we'd go off and play somewhere and I ended up staying up all night and then they dropped me back the next day, dishevelled, and I'd go in and change it back into my suit and tie. Uh, managed to string that out for about two years until really I'd used up all my holiday and I'd used up all my sick leave and and that, you know, no they, way they, they knew, they, they, they said to me, you need to make a decision. And I, and I was thinking, well, what am I going to do? And then 
We had an offer, the band I was in had an offer to play at the Top Ten Club in Hamburg, which is where the Beatles played. Wow. And, uh, but it meant going there for two months, which meant the job was over. So I told my folks, and I said, I'm going to have to quit the civil service to go and play where the Beatles played. And they gave me their blessing. So on Friday afternoon, I said goodbye to the civil service when they gave me lots of uh, old spice and <laughs> talcum powder and all the things you give people when they leave. And that was on a Friday, and by Tuesday, I was living with a stripper in Hamburg who had an open top sports car and a poodle. <laughs> and so it was the same place where the Beatles like cut their teeth. They played it in a couple of places. Um, the Kaiser Keller, I think. Um, and there was uh, another one. There's a third one, I can't remember. And the Top Ten Club was one of the last ones they did. And, and we did the same as them. You play for, uh, during the week, you play for six 45 minute spots a night. You go on stage for 45 minutes, come off at 15, go back on. You do six of those, then on the weekend you would do eight, and on a Sunday you would do seven. And you do that for six weeks. Makes you pretty good by the time you finish playing that much. Yeah, and were you, so were you playing guitar at this point? Guitar and keyboards. And um, keyboards were very rudimentary in those days, though I had um, um, a Hona Pianet, which is the cheap end of the electric piano, couldn't afford a Fender piano. But the pianet was quite good because um, it was quite popular in the late 60s. And in fact, it's the one that they played on Get Back that Billy Preston played. So right. um, it was a proper keyboard, but it seems a bit rinky dink now. Still got it. Um, but I also then, having been to the Isle of Wight Festival in 1970 and seen Chicago play, I took up the trombone because I just love the idea of horns. Mm -hmm. And we had a horn player, so I took up trombone. So you're playing three instruments at yeah. this stage, yeah. And w were you getting all your experience just kind of playing live, really? That's where you got it. It's um, the music college of real life, you know. And uh, but it was a different world then. Lots of places to play. In fact, England, post-war, um, playing live was the thing. Records were not the thing, but playing live. So I mean, the Beatles were so good as a band because they could play three different venues in one day. They'd do a lunchtime session at the Cavern, they'd go off and play a pub at five o'clock, then they'd do another pub at, at 10 o'clock or something. And all bands had this open to them that you could play, I, I could play three or four times a week in the south of England, and so, which meant that you could be a working band. If you had a reputation for being live, a great live, you could exist without a record deal. Yeah, and there were lots of us buzzing around trying to get record deals, of course, but living by uh, doing uh, playing the top ten hits cover cover bands really. But it made you really good, and, and there was fierce competition out there as well. Lots of really good bands vying for the work. And so, what what year was it that you went to Hamburg? Um, Nineteen seventy one. And was and was that the kind of year where you was it full time from then on? Yeah, from then on. I mean, I'd left the, I'd left the civil service and the last thing they said to me is that uh, we'll keep your job open for three years. <laughs> uh, you can come back in at the same grade uh, if you come back within three years. So. But I never had any thoughts about that. <laughs> and from then on, you went on to work with just an unbelievable um, yeah. who's um, who of people. Well, what How happened, uh, well, be, being in a band and uh, learning all these songs, we learned the hits of the day, and you get to learn things quickly. Um, so you'd hear something, and you would know what you were going to play without spending too much time, you know, because I'd done a lot of my woodshedding by sitting at home and putting the arm needle back on the start of the record and learning note for note, and, and it's a muscle. You just get better and better at it. So. And uh, as you understand how things work, you'd hear a record and you can immediately figure out its component parts. Um, nothing to do with reading, actually. It's all about the ear and understanding the groove. Um, so then, having sort of played uh, residencies in Hamburg, did two or three of those. And then we went to Australia and did three months out in Perth and Adelaide, which we enjoyed very much at the beginning of the 70s. Um, came back from that and got a call to say that uh, an American artist called Ben E. King, the man who, who wrote Stand By Me, was coming to tour. And in the 70s, there were lots of American military personnel and American Air Force bases. So it's, you know, we've just passed the Cold War. Cold War still probably going on. 
So lots of servicemen who had to be entertained. So the Americans would bring over American artists to entertain them. Most of the servicemen were black, so they liked Tamil Motown and soul music, music at the time. Uh, and it was too expensive to bring over a 10-piece band, so they would bring over the singer and a band leader. And then they would hire locally. And we were one of the bands that got hired because we had horn players. Well, I played trombone and the, you know, the, a dedicated saxophone player and another guy doubled on sax. So we could do a fairly good uh, lineup. And, and there were only five of us. And so if, they, if the artist brought over a piano player or a guitarist, that would be a six piece band. Uh, it cost them nothing. So we liked it because it got us a lot of work around England and Europe. And so Benny King was the first one, that went very well, and then word got around and the next one we did was a guy called Edwin Starr. Wow. And we were fans of his. I actually bought his records as yeah. a teenager. So here I was playing with somebody who I really admired, you know, and his music was much tougher, uh, not as, as sweet as, the, as Benny King's mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but it was all... So did that feel like... Yeah, that was like fantastic. Wow, we, yeah, wow, wow, we were really playing. Good. We were playing records that I owned with the original artist. That was a major step up yeah. from being a covers band. Uh, and of course, you learn so much. All of a sudden, it's like working with James Brown in my mind. And I, and I did something wrong one night, and he came over and did that to me. And each one of those was fifty dollars fine, because I, I copped up badly. And that was how Americans run their bands through fear. Um, very <laughs> unusual. I mean, because English people don't work like that. I'm pretty sure they still don't but certainly not in those days. Um, and I learned um, discipline, you know, pay attention. Um, your employer is your boss, he expects you to be uh, on the case. And, and how do you get to that, you know, so at that, at that stage, when you're playing with people like um, Edwin Starr, like, would they, be, would they be rehearsing with you guys, or would, did they kind of like step in? To okay, um, again, it's all about speed. The, the reason that we got the gig was that we could learn it really quickly. Yeah. So they would send over a set list of, and it was invariably the greatest hits, and we would prepare that of going into the rehearsal. But we'd only get one afternoon's rehearsal. Yeah. Um, uh, and more, it would probably be with their band leader, who would just point things out top and tail. No, he doesn't play it like that anymore. It's been changed. Uh, you do it like this, you do it like that. And so we'd be sort of like 90% ready. Then Edwin would come in, run through it once, and then we hit the road. And the rest we do as we go. You know. Yeah. It was, again, good training, in, uh, really intense pressurised, you know, sort of hothouse learning. And did you, have, were there any, like, around that stage, any massive kind of moments where you thought, God, is this gonna, am I gonna be able to last in a, in a, in a, in a career like that? This is so high pressure, it's so... Um, the pressure didn't bother me. I found that um, if I understood the music, and uh, then I could, and I could learn my part, then I felt okay. Um, what did bother me was the fact that um, later on, we did this these, uh, in the early 70s, I did the tours backing these other people, and then things changed a bit, I think. Uh, either the bases didn't book as much, and there was certainly a lull in that, but also I thought, I don't want to get caught on that circuit forever, because it would be easy to get swallowed up and, and just end up just going around the same places with a different artist every yeah. every other week and I could see that we weren't getting anywhere. Um, uh, when punk hit in 76 I was kind of at a crossroads because I felt like a bit like a fish out of water because I was a soul boy, I liked Stevie Wonder and I didn't like the Sex Pistols. And, uh, and just at a point when I was thinking what am I going to do now and the sort of the band we were in, the work was drying up, we kind of found myself in uh, Amsterdam where I'd been in a club uh, working for about a month and it was going great uh, and then the club closed down and the, you know it got busted because it was a huge drug dealing den <laughs> it wasn't to do with music at all and we were just a front for this, uh, to these brothers who were selling drugs um, so everybody else came back to England because they had girlfriends or relationships or whatever to try and keep going I was single and I thought I'm not going back to England to sit around if I'm going to sit around I'll do it in Amsterdam Funnily enough, um, where are we now? About 77, I think. Um, unemployed in Amsterdam. And <laughs> who comes through but Marvin Gaye, supported by Edwin Starr. So this is about three, four years down the line since we worked with him. 
But Edwin Starr, the master of reinvention, had caught on to the disco fad that had taken off in America. So while we had punk, America had disco. And it took off really big. So 77 to 80 was big, big disco time. And he had written a hit and had a, it got to number two in the charts called Ice White Contact. And so his career came out of the doldrums and here he was opening for Marvin Gaye and came through Amsterdam and I went to the show and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm not written anything really. He said, pack your bag, you're coming with me. And I went, okay, I could do that. Um, except that the keyboard player that he had took exception to it because he could see the writing on the wall. I think there was some kind of friction going on there. But basically he knew that I was going to be replacing because I knew everything. I knew all the songs. I only had to learn the new hit and everything else was just punk stuff. Yeah. So within about five days, he banged on my door and said, what, the, what are you doing? You're stealing my job. I said, I'm not stealing your job. You're losing your job through your attitude and you're difficult to work with. And if you don't pull your socks up, you're going to be on a plane home. And he went, I'm on a plane home now. And uh, I said, Are you sure about that? This tour's still got a ways to go and you can probably see it out and make some money. And he said, no, you know, and so he quit there and then. Of course, it didn't matter. I knew all the stuff, so I just fell into the fell into the thing. Um, and and you tried th to stop him as well. Well, I tried to help him and say, you can actually ease this gently through. There's still weeks to go, and it's not over. There's room for both of us on the, on this, you know, two keyboard players. There actually was, you know, if he'd have been sensible. A knee-jerk reaction, you know. Um, he should have played the long game. Um, so there I find myself uh, working in a, a band now with all American musicians, some black, some white, touring America, playing or going through the southern states. I mean, one day, uh, the drummer, this man, mountain, black guy, who had survived the Vietnam War, and he would carry a machine gun that was two men would normally carry. He was huge. Um, and the bass player had played with some amazing bands, again, that I, you know, the OJs and people like that, who I was a fan of. And um, one day they said, hey, you need to go into the gas station and you need to get some, get me some cigarettes or get me some candy. And I went, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute, you know. I'm, I'm here and I'm new, but I'm not the bloody errand boy. You want sweets or cigarettes, you can just go in. I'm not thinking, I'm telling this guy what to do. <laughs> And, and he, he looked at me and said, no, you don't understand. We're in Alabama. If we go in there, we'll get shot. <laughs> you, only white people can go in there. And I went, oh, it's a different world out here, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and so then uh, through those states, I, I was their representative um, when, when it was in, impossible for them to. And then on the other side, they took me to places. And I went and witnessed social events that white people wouldn't be able to go to. And so I would have the drummer, who's you know, top, like two separate wardrobes, put his <laughs> arm around me and at uh, one place he actually said, uh, this is my buddy from England. So you fuck with him, you'll be fucking with me. <laughs> and I thought, okay, it's good to have friends in high places. Well, that, must, that must have been, was that your first tour in America? It point? was, and um, I soon found out that, that apparently you needed something called a work permit, okay. apparently, um, which nobody had bothered bothered with because people in back in those days thought, oh, you can just yeah. get on a plane, you just. Um, and I became very aware that I was working illegally and that if I got caught, um, I could be blacklisted uh, as a musician, which means I get kicked out of the country and don't come back. Um, and one day, uh, right near the end of the tour, uh, we were playing. Disney World in um, in Florida, and I was just setting up and just got the sound check, just tinkling around on the piano. And uh, guy came up and just engaged me in conversation and started asking me questions about being a Brit and this that, and the other. And I thought this feels weird. This conversation is weird. And um, and he said, "So are you in the band?" I said, "Oh no, no, I'm just friends of the guys. When they tour in England, I go along, and I'm just here on holiday." Smartest thing I ever said because he was the local union rep and right. he was checking out to see who was legit and who wasn't. And uh, I would have ended up in jail if I'd have given the wrong answer right there. So 
Um, I turned round and said to Edwin Starr and his management, apparently I need to work permit. And they went, do you? <laughs> Playing the, uh, uh, the innocent. And I said, look, I need to, we either need to get this right or I need to go. And I've been out on the road for quite a few months and I was a little bit homesick. And I said, look, I'll do the last three shows, the final show being the Greek theatre in um, Hollywood. And, uh, and then I'm going home. And you can get me a work permit and I'll come back. Or you don't and I don't come back. But the last show we did was opening for Aretha Franklin. Wow. And at the front, it was on the verge of being cancelled because two days before the show, her father, the Reverend Franklin, was shot in an armed robbery in his house. And he was lying in a coma in, a, in an IC in an intensive care unit. Now... Obviously, most normal people would have cancelled their show, uh, but she didn't. She uh, decided she was going to do it. So, on stage, we opened for her, and then, of course, uh, the um, security was n nowhere near like it is now, back in the 70s. And so, when the our gig was over, they just wheeled out her grand piano, and I just stood here in the wings, and five feet away from me was Aretha Franklin playing and singing. And then she did a whole section of gospel music dedicated to her father, which was like one of the most emotionally charged things I've ever That's witnessed. And, and at that point, I was pinching myself saying, I'm a white boy from Portsmouth. What am I doing here? <laughs> and then the next day I got on a plane, went home and signed on the doll. God. Yeah, I mean, that shows, that shows you sort of like the highs. and All in the same week. Yeah. Uh, it, it sounds like, I mean, this is even before we've got to so many things that you've done as well. Yeah. And uh, I mean, so at that point, what, what, what did you think then? Um, I mean, it sounds like you took things like in your stride, though. Mm. Like, it's very interesting. Uh, um, by now, so where are we? 78, 78, 79, 78, I think. Um, so then what am I in my late 20s? Um, and uh, England was still in the throes of punk and what was going on around it. And I found it quite difficult to relate to. Um, tried, it just wasn't in my musical DNA to be uh, spitting and, and, and not caring about whether the chords were correct, which seemed a lot, a lot of punk music to me. It was just people being lazy musically and yeah. not worrying whether the chords actually work. You know? And some of that I'll get, that's fine. Um, but generally I found it a bit sort of, in, I was indifferent to it. Yeah. So um, so then I here I am on the dole. I just gig around the south coast, um, playing in bars and trying to s scratch a living together, waiting to see what would happen. Um, but you can't sit around and wait for the phone to ring. And eventually, I had to give up on the south coast. And moved to London, which I didn't want to do. I never wanted to live in London, ever. I didn't like it. It was noisy. I didn't like the people. The atmosphere of it was way too intense. I liked the laid-back atmosphere of the South Coast. Um, but that had to change. So managed to find myself a place to crash in London. Uh, first job I had was outside of Victoria Station, giving away free magazines to the secretaries going to, going to work. There was a magazine called Miss London which was free, and I gave it out on Monday mornings. And um, you had to phone in at 4 a.m. to confirm that you were going to be at your, st your place. At 4 a.m.? Yeah, to phone in at 4 a.m. and then be in position at 5 a.m. So at 5 a.m. I would be stood outside of Victoria Station, uh, giving out the free magazine to all the secretaries coming into work. You know. And then at 9 a.m. when I was finished, I'd get paid... Then I'd go straight to the cafe and spend most of it eating sausage, egg and chips and trying to warm up because it was so bloody cold. <laughs> and even now when I walk past um, Victoria Station, I have a shiver <laughs> thinking about it. But, yeah. but it meant that I was in London and, I, and it's all about opportunity. So uh, yeah. an opportunity arose in... Uh, I was looking through to... I thought, well, what can I do if I can't... You know, I don't know anybody here. So my musical t contacts were all down on the south coast they were of no use whatsoever and one mate who uh, was a percussionist and he had moved up so I spoke to him said I am here now 
Uh, and then I opened the paper and it said um, staff wanted for a new club opening in Covent Garden. And um, I looked down and it was a club called Stringfellows. Mm. Now Stringfellows, I knew Peter Stringfellow yeah. because he used to own a club in Leeds, which my little local band used to go out and play. And I knew that his DJ was a guy called Pete Tyler, who I was very friendly with four or five years ago, before this. So I thought, I'm going to take a chance that Pete Tyler is involved in it. Um, so I phoned up the number. It said, our oh, bar staff wanted. So I thought, I don't know anything about you know, bar staff. I know how to drink. But I thought, great to be working in something of a night clubby thing while I'm trying to get the music to work. So I phoned up and I said, uh, hi, it's Pete Tyler there. And he said, hang on, wait a minute. I went, um, Pete comes on the phone and I said, Tyler, it's me. And he went, bloody hell, you know. He said, what are you up to? I said, I'm just here looking around, you know, just moved to London. He said, okay, uh, what are you doing tomorrow? He said, <laughs> I said, nothing, why? He said, come in. I said, all right, all right, come in for what? He said, well, come in and say hello to Stringfellow. And he said, we've got a grand piano here, you can just play for him. I went, okay. So what I did was, I hadn't done, uh, all I'd done was play in bars and do horrible, raucous stuff for drunk people. Um, and I'd done it with a mate who played saxophone, because it's so destroying doing that stuff on your own. If there's two of you, you can have a bit of a, a laugh and yeah. it takes all the pressure off. Um, so I phoned up my mate and I said, I don't know how this is going to work. Grab your saxophone, come to my place. There's a piano here, and we've got to work something out. And uh, and I said to him, one of the things that people play in bars and restaurants that are sophisticated, and he went, oh, girl from Ipanema, fly me to the moon, and satin doll. And I said, so they're all, we sat there, and he went through it, because he knew them as a sax player, but I never played that kind of stuff. And so we worked out the chords. And the next, and the later that, that, that afternoon, we go into Stringfellows and we go and sit. I sit down at the piano, and he gets his sax out. And uh, Peter Stringfellow, the owner, comes in. He said, "Oh, guys, yeah, whatever, you know, five years ago, go way back." And so we start playing the girl from Ipanema and uh, fly me to the moon. And at the end of it, I said, "I said, you could play for three hours, five nights a week." Oh God! <laughs> so we looked at each other and went, "Okay." So we. Um, we ran down to Bond Street to Chapels and got the 100 greatest cocktail hits <laughs> and went back to it and learned 10 of them. And uh, the next night we started and we played these 10 songs. On repeat. Very slowly at first <laughs> and then a bit faster. <laughs> at the end of the night, even faster. And then the next day we learned another 10 and 10. And I ended up being there from uh, 1981 through to 84, but the thing was we had such a good relationship with him that he allowed me to put depths in. So when I started to tour and do other things, as the music picked up, I could relinquish. And then when I came back, I would just go back into the gear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's great. I gave work to other piano players around town and then I had something. And that really cemented uh, my life, which meant I was quite stable and um, I've got a mortgage within a year. I started oh. paying for a flat. I mean, from being penniless and on the dole, a year later I got a mortgage and a, and a flat. So from making the move to London? Yeah. Essentially. So that was uh, quite a seismic shift. In, and, it, and in attitude, and also the fact that um, got uh, the guy who was the uh, percussionist, he got a, j a job as tape op in a studio in Soho, uh, Greek Street, Frith Street. And um, one day, he called me and he said, oh, we need a horn section, are you and, can you get a, the guys together and come and play horns? And I said, sure. And I said, um, who's it for? He said, I have no idea. Just be here at four o'clock. And uh, so I go, we go there at four o'clock, we walk in, in comes this band. And, Hello. and I said, what are you called again? They said, oh, we're called Duran Duran. I went, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> and um, we ended up playing on their first single. And then touring with them.
Wow. And, and it all kind of spiraled from that. Really. And, and you were playing trombone? Trombone, yeah. So I spent uh, the early 80s playing trombone. There were few trombonists around. So Duran Duran led to Dexys Midnight Runners, who had a big hit with a song called Come On, Eileen. And from there, um, we got to meet Tony Visconti, who was Bowie's and Mark Boland's producer. And he started using this, and he, he did an album with uh, Boomtown Rats, uh, which is Bob Gelber. Yeah, yeah. So I started a sort of a very long friendship with Gelber from that point onwards. Wow. So all sorts of huge. Yeah, being at the right place at the right time and being and say yes to everything. Yeah. And, I mean, and so when you toured with Duran Duran, was that like a world? No, was that UK or was that is that in the early stages of their very career? very early stages? Um, we played uh, on a couple of their tracks, including the the twelve inch version of uh, Planet Earth, which was their first single and first hit, because they they caught a wave immediately. I mean, um, they had the look of the time, so uh, the record company really promoted them as pretty boys, and so they got an awful lot of promotion, and their star rose very quickly, and. Uh, so they were going to do their first gig in Europe, and they uh, first tour in Europe. And they said to us, we did a show in London for them. And they said, we're doing a, a showcase or something for the record company in Paris tomorrow. Would you come and play uh, on it, me and the sax player? And we said, great, yeah, what are we doing? Are we going to fly over, get in, get in your truck or get in your coach or whatever? Come. He said, no, we don't really have room for you. Here's 50 quid, see you there. So we, we made our own way over to Paris and played, and they said, that's brilliant. Um, do you want to play Amsterdam? He said, yeah. He said, well, here's 50 quid, see you there. So we became known as the See You There Tour. <laughs> and they would just go off, and we would follow around by, on train. Wow. And ended up uh, playing in Birmingham. We did about five, six shows, I think. And so, and so from, the, from there, how did things leap? Because you, I mean, obviously you went on to work for Queen, but there were other people. Well, uh, we were sort of uh, guns for hire and really learned the, the ropes of being sort of, um, you know, just turn up, know the stuff, be affable, don't make a fuss, and you work. The work will, you know, people... People start to... Yeah, people like to, to have you around because you're not a problem. You know, if you, if you start giving them shit, and you don't last very long, and, and it was great. I was having fun. Um, we had a horn section sometimes, we were three, most, most of the time we were just two, sax and trombone. Um, and the Boomtown Rats were a big laugh, we had a lot of fun with them, and then started doing, caught, getting called in for sessions, did something for Thomas Dolby, and, and all kinds of people um, through the early 80s. And then one night, uh, I was in Stringfellows playing, and in comes a guy that I hadn't seen for like, well, so here are we, we're in 83, and this guy I wouldn't have seen for 10 years, and he was, uh, he had been uh, a lighting crew guy for a band that we knew back in the day, and he walks in and we go, oh, God, what's you? And we have a bit of a chat, and I said, what are you doing now? He said, oh, uh, I'm a drum tech for Queen. So this was 80, 83, and he said, um... They've just recorded an album. They'll be looking for a keyboard player when they when they go want to go on tour. Do you want the gig? I went, oh yeah, of course. You know, that sort of party bar talk. You don't. Yeah. It you doesn't. Think it's going to come. Forward. Oh, that's not the way things are done. You know. I mean, things are done in a much more sort of formalised way. Um, and I didn't think anything of, anything of it. So I carry on doing what I'm doing, and you know, Boomtown Rats tours and whatever. And then all of a sudden, it's um, the summer of '84. And he comes in again, and he said, I said, oh, how's it going? He said, oh, I've been promoted from drum tech to Roger Taylor's personal assistant. I went, oh, ooh, really? He said, well, that gig's up if you want it. And I went, yeah, this is not how it goes. So, and he said, well, give me a cassette of your stuff. Now, you, there isn't a cassette of my stuff as a keyboard player, because I've been playing um, Fly Me to the Moon for the past four years, or I've been playing trombone, so... yeah. What, what is there? There's nothing. So I tried to find something with me playing something that's a bit more rocky. And certainly not for a band who, like Queen. It wasn't really their style. And, uh, and so, completely, no hope of anything. Um, I put together a tape of, of four or five things, including a comedy record that I played trombone on and co-produced, <laughs> and just as a gimmick. You know. and, uh, and I gave him to him. I said, this is rubbish. I mean, really, I'm going to have to sit down and play for them. 
for this to mean anything. And he said, no worries. Um, I get a, a call from uh, a secretary saying, oh, hello, can you come over to uh, Notting Hill Gate and be here at three o'clock tomorrow afternoon uh, for an interview? And I said, what, for an audition? She said, well, an interview. I thought, oh, God, you get interviewed before you even get a chance to audition. You know? So I'll go over and um, the Georgian townhouse and uh, quite a bustling office and it's all uh, off, just office stuff and gold records and posters and whatever. And um, they said, oh, okay, you can go up now. I thought, oh, here we go. There's probably 200 keyboard players upstairs and I'm going to be sat there waiting because this is how auditions normally are. Um, anyway, I go up, I go into a room, and there's me sat on a desk, and a, a guy comes in, and he says, right, he says, uh, did you bring your passport? Like, yeah. He says, let me make a copy of it. Shh, fine. Um, and, um, right, this tour kicks off, uh, and will probably last for four months, are you, is that all right? Are you going to vote Yeah. He said, okay, right, um... I'm going to get you an airline ticket. You're going to fly to Munich on Monday and start rehearsals. I mean, flying to Munich to start rehearsals? I haven't, haven't even met them. Supposing they don't like me. He said, well, then on Tuesday you'll fly back. <laughs> That's and it incredible. Out. Yeah. And, I mean, at, the, at, you know, at that point did you think, you know, my life's changed forever? Or did you see it as a, you know, this is another job? I well... First of all, I didn't think it would last for more than that one tour. Yeah. But I realised that um, I'd stepped through into another level and that this would be use. And also, it was the first proper keyboard gig I'd done since leaving Edwin Starr in the late 70s because I'd done so much, I'd played so many horn gigs yeah. that I was kind of known as a horn player by this time. Um, and the, were you at all like out of practice or no? Because you've been playing. I played years. every night in the bar, you know. Yeah. And it's just a question of uh, wearing the, the right musical hat. You know? Yeah, yeah. So and the trick to being a, a sideman is always just be as prepared as possible, so that you don't hold proceedings up. Because the one thing that established musicians hate is waiting for you to learn their stuff. So I did a lot of homework, a crash course in, oh, I didn't even like Queen particularly, to tell you the truth, I wasn't a fan. I like Stevie Wonder, you know, it's a world away. Um, and so I was quite sort of, uh, what's the word, Remo removed from it. So I wasn't really that in awe. I mean, I knew they could play a, a bit and I realized that the guitar player was pretty special in terms of, he was, had his own unique style. And I liked the singer. But I didn't particularly like their, what they did. There were a few things that worked. Um, so I took it as another job, and I just got their, their greatest hits and their, their, their la video of their last tour and also a copy of their new album and spent the weekend hothousing through it, you know, just making my own notes of all the songs. See, so they'll take a bunch of songs from the last tour. They must do the big ones. So there's obvious 10 songs are going to be... And then from the new album, one of the singles, well, it was Radio Gaga, I Want to Break Free, Hammer to Four, learn those, because they'll be playing those, and there'll be two or three that will be thrown at me. So yeah. I walked in there, kind of knowing it, you know? So when they say, all right, we're going to play this song, I didn't have to go, oh, well, no, I don't exactly. know that, you know, anything yeah. like that. And, and I would never say, I don't know that. And they say, um, we want to have a go at this song. And I said... Oh yeah, just let me get my notes. I said, can, can we have five minutes? And I would just quickly get them on. Walkmans had just come out at that time and they're quite useful and I had everything there. And I, I said, I'm just going to go to the toilet. And I go up to the toilet and I'd actually crash the chords out quickly if it was something I hadn't heard before. But that was only a couple of times. It wasn't. Uh... And then as, as we got to know, know each other, I'd be, I was able to say, hmm, don't know that one. Do you want to give me a minute? And they said, yeah, fine. You know. So and once I got their trust, it was fine. And so do you think it helped the fact that you weren't too... But I mean, I guess, were you kind of more starstruck when you were working for big soul stars? Yeah, yeah, most, certainly. Back in the early days, I was Benny King, you know. He was a god to me, and everybody yeah. starts starting out being a god to me, and then being an annoyance. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of lost... 
that starstruck thing, which is good, really, because yeah. you don't want to be sat next, next to somebody uh, and be thinking, oh my God, oh my God, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm next to this fabulous thing. You want to be thinking, right, what am I going to do here? What's my role in this? Yeah. How do I deliver what they want? You know? Years later, when I was doing the, uh, I was uh, the musical director for the Nelson Mandela concerts, Four Triple Six Four, and I, uh, we'd done a couple of big shows with lots of artists coming through, lots of big artists. Uh, and the last show we did was for uh, his 92nd birthday, and it was Radio City, New York. Um, and Stevie Wonder was on that gig. Now Stevie right. Wonder, I've met him over the years, come many times, um, and. But he would play with his band. He didn't play with the house band, which was a real shame. But that was his call. Um, and it came to the end of the show, and uh, I was sat at my keyboards here, and Stevie Wonder was sat at his piano there, and he was playing. And his band leader is um, Charles. Oh, is it Watts? What is his name? That's Charlie Watts. That can't be right. Um, anyway, he's bass. Nathan Watts. Nathan Watts is his bass player. It's his band leader as well, and he's like. Very stocky uh, man with big charisma, and he's been with Stevie for years, and and I'm kind of very respectful towards him. Um, anyway, then Stevie plays his set, and at the end of it, they finish uh, with the Stevie Wonder version of "Happy Birthday." That's for Nelson Mandela, and I'm sat there thinking, oh, I could just play, you know, I could be involved in this, you know. <laughs> and I look up, and uh, Nathan, the bass player, looks at me and goes. So I'll get, get, I'm allowed to join in. Wow. So I'll get to play organ next to Stevie Wonder. And as far as I was concerned, that was the best. That's the pinnacle. That's it. Yeah, everything else pales into insignificance. Was that because Stevie Wonder's just such a big influence? Yeah, and also because he's a talent. I mean, uh, you work with a lot of people and you say, okay, you can sing a bit, you can play a bit, you understand what they do. Uh, his singing, his playing, his uh, composing is off the charts. And you'll find that uh, my peer group, most people, rock stars, whatever, will say, who's the one? And they'll say, well, if it isn't Jimi Hendrix and it isn't Lennon McCartney, it's Stevie Wonder. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And most people, when they're asked that, so, because that is one of the questions that I like to ask is, you know, who, who are the greatest? Yeah. So I guess you've answered it there. But yeah. mo a lot of people say, do say the Beatles. And yeah, yeah, I mean, they changed everything. And uh, Where was it that you saw them back in Portsmouth, Portsmouth Guildhall. So it was it quite a small? It's my local town hall, yeah. wow. which I've played in many times. Yeah. And um, so, because obviously, you know, uh, starting gigging with Queen was a, a big turning point. But um, I've also seen you recently playing the you playing with your own band, SAS band, mm. um, which recently celebrated its twenty fifth anniversary. How so? How did how did that come about? That came off the back. Of uh, well, once Freddie Mercury died, uh, both Roger Taylor and uh, Brian May uh, sort of retreated into not doing much or releasing some solo stuff. Brian May released uh, an album called Back to the Light, I think about 93, 94, and I got roped in for that and toured with um, Cozy Powell on drums. Uh, do you know who that is, Cozy Powell? It's a big name. Yeah, he is. Who, who, uh, he, Cozy Powell, uh, he drummed in uh, White Snake, Black Sabbath, and a million other. But it was he was a major. He had hits as a drummer, which is quite unusual. Um, he had big hits as Cozy Powell. As Cozy Powell, yeah. yeah. Um, and he played with Jeff Beck and quite a lot of people. Um, so he was on drums for the. He Brian was on drums for the first Brian May tour. Yeah. And uh, when that tour finished in 1994, um, I got a call from. Uh, somebody in Gosport. Uh, Gosport was one of the places I lived down on the south coast and uh, had some notoriety. I, that was where I was on the dole and playing bars back in the, in the late 70s. And so here we are in 1994 and um, the local festival organiser called me up and said, we've got this little festival down and uh, on the c common down by the high street and uh, we've got uh, somebody's let us down. Could you put together a jam session for us on the Friday night. And my, my teeth itched at the thought of it because jam sessions normally means indulgence and endless guitar solos. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, if I'm going to do it, you're going to pay, pay me proper money and I'll get proper people and we'll come and do something proper. 
And he said, good, go ahead. So I got the Brian May band without Brian. And I called up a couple of, uh, uh, there's a guy called Chris Thompson, who was the singer of Man for a Man's Earth Band, who sang uh, Blinded by the Light. Yeah. Big hit. Incredible. Well, I'd met him, he'd done some stuff with Brian, and uh, and I knew him to be in London, and uh, I went to the Jazz Cafe and bumped into Tony Hadley, who had left Spandau Ballet and was kicking his heels. And I spoke to him, and I went to see Kiki D, and spoke to her. And I said, look, I've got this thing, do you want to come down? A few bob, do a couple of songs, and we'll see how we go. Uh, and that's what we did. Um, we, we had a couple of uh, Queen songs in there somewhere, and everybody played one or two of their biggest hits, and then one or two of the songs they love, you know, classic. And lo and behold, we have a show. And um, it went down really well. And then the next thing I know, people are phoning me up saying, oh, you did that thing. In gospel, do you want to come and do something, private parties? And it just rolled from there. And then I started to ask more and more people, and if the budget's there, you can get anybody, really. Yeah. So th and that's where we are today. And it just spread through word of mouth. Yeah, I mean, but very, very little promotion. I mean, we do a bit of promotion now on social media, but most people, it's word of mouth. Yeah. yeah. And did so, so through work, working um, with, with your own band, um, did you get to play with like people who you hadn't worked with before? Yes. Who, who you were just quite excited to work yeah, with? Yeah, so I'm, um, I was able to st start phoning up and saying, right, I've got this situation, this is who I am, this is what we intend to do, I've got money, do you want to come? And most people say yes. They will do. And the more you do, of course, the more they, they trust you. And uh, and now I, really, I just send out a little text there saying, who's up for Friday the 5th in August in Portsmouth or wherever? And they'll all come back. So yeah, I'm in. I'm in. You know, so. Wow. It gets easier. And, and what do you? So what do you? Because you have how many gigs do you play at the moment with with Queen? Have you well, but Queen have got, have got a resurgence a um, uh, since 2011 when uh, Adam Lambert came on board. There's there's been an upward curve in the demand to see them, which was only heightened by the release of the, the movie, which has opened it up to an even wider audience. I mean, the audience was quite wide. We get um, old long-standing fans and new fans you know the kids who've been hearing the records from their parents but now we've got people who saw the movie love it and have discovered them yeah. and uh, it that's gone off the charts and who knows where how that or where that ends you know that's just, it's, just it's, more and more and more I mean we're booked in for 10 nights at the O2 it's, uh, it's unbelievable isn't yeah it? I mean it's sort of like bigger than it oh, yeah. it's ever been yeah, probably. Because yeah. the movie was an insane yeah. success. Was it the biggest movie? Of I think it's the biggest uh, biopic or biopic, whatever they call it. Um, I think, yeah, so far. I mean, it's it, over a billion dollars. I think it's taken. And have you grow? Have you sort of over the years grown like more and more attached to the to the Queen stuff as before, or is it still sold to you know really? Do you know what? Um, I mean, uh, uh, of course, I've, uh, I've grown attached to it. There are, there are bits and pieces I like, but I like the vibe and. Um, uh, it's a case of, I'm glad I wasn't a real fan at the beginning, you know, because that might have been a That might have stopped you developing such a Maybe. good working relationship. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. You can't say, really. Um, uh, and now I'm, you know, uh, there are a couple of guys in the band who, who know their Queen history, and they say, oh, there's a great song called so and so and I go, I don't even know what you're talking about, and I have to look it up and check it out. But we're at a, a place now where uh, people are coming to see this show I mean, basically, seen the movie, and they know the hits, and that's what they want. They don't want too much stuff yeah. that's gonna. I mean, we do have these moments <laughs> when we might throw in a track that's a little bit more obscure or a deeper cut, as you say. And I call it a meerkat song because they're all going like this. The audience are looking around, saying, "What the fuck is this?" You know? um, and uh, and you can tell that the interest is not quite as intense as when you play. Under pressure, or another one. Yeah, the people tend to go to go to the bathroom and go to get beer. Yeah, you know, it can happen. Yeah, it's actually, quite they're, annoying. Actually, so actually no, they're good to hear the deep cuts. Yeah, it is, and uh, I'm, I'm being a little bit disingenuous here. The show is spectacular. Very few people want to go to the bathroom when the yeah. show's on, because, no, regardless of the yeah, yeah, because uh, because uh, I mean, uh, Queen shows have a reputation for being uh, really a feast for the ears and eyes, and and they go out of their way to deliver something to make people go home and say, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. And that's their rum.
their aim, and they and that's what they do. But it's nice. Yeah. So it's clearly one of the greatest bands. Yeah, um, and they do really live. They know their stuff. You know, they know what works. They're very uh, acute and, and and Adam as well has a great eye and a great um, feel for what works and what doesn't work. And so they are meticulous in their what they present. And nothing really is left to chance in terms of um, what's going on here. Are we doing this to the best that we can possibly can, either technically or, or artistically or whatever? Have we got this right? And I admire that. I think that's fantastic. Because um, there are so many artists now that just stick a bunch of dancers on stage and have some lights going off and they think that's a show and it's not really. Yeah, well, so what, what do you make of the direction that, because obviously, um, as we were saying earlier, you know, like it's not records, it's live that that is the music industry nowadays. Um, and what, what do you make of the, the music industry nowadays? Are you a fan of streaming? Do you think it's difficult to suss out who's actually any good because we've all got access to so much? Well, that, yeah, I mean, that is the problem, isn't it? If everybody can make a record and everybody can release it, um, you've got a million people releasing records. Um, and so getting cutting through to find the real quality, but quality comes through. Um, it always has done, but I'm sure some gets... Uh, lost by the wayside, and it's quite difficult for new artists. Um, we've got a, a friend, a young guy called Kyan, who's uh, almost uh, stands out in the fact that he's he is a very talented uh, composer, performer. And he's almost like a young Stevie Wonder in, in what he does, but he needs to fight through to get seen and get heard. Um, and you have to build up a following online before anyone will give you a, a gig, because over the years, the gigs have shrunken. So where do you play? I mean, there's a few places still around, and you get you, 128 on the bill at Glastonbury or something, you know, to, to start yeah. off. You can end up losing money for the first few years of your career by playing live, and that may be the only way you really build a following. So it's tough, actually. Yeah. Very tough. It's always been tough, but in different ways. But um, I always have faith that true talent can hopefully can through. still get through maybe it's just actually the case that it's like everybody can everybody's got a way of putting their stuff up as you said a million people can make a record so it just means that you have to be except beyond exception yeah right now. and some yeah. people who maybe lucked out in the past and then became great and were given more of a chance yeah but who knows so what i wanted to ask you as my final question is i mean it could potentially already be answered because that must have been spectacular putting together the Nelson Mandela concert. Um, but so perhaps I'd like to ask you three kind of moments or things that you'd highlight as being things that you're particularly proud of over the course of your career. People that you've worked with or concerts that you've done. Or... Well, I mean, to have been on stage at Live Aid uh, is now... Uh, uh, a moment, but back then it wasn't a moment, it was just a day at the office uh, because we came off stage thinking, thinking, well, we did what we came to do. We came here 20 minutes, we played a bunch of songs, and we buggered off. Did you realise how good it was? No, at the time? well, no, I mean, we, we knew how good we were, but yeah. we were match fit. There's a, another um, misnomer from the movie. The movie uh, seems to indicate that after a long break, Live Aid yeah. was a, a, a resurgence, they came back to play, some complete bollocks. Yeah. Um, no, we toured. We done. Uh, a, we'd been on tour in the autumn of '84, and then we kicked off uh, in the early part of '85. Went to Japan and Australia, yada yada yada. And if you and picked then, out any kind of recording of a gig from then, would it all sound like really good? Yeah, because it was just really good. Yeah, it was all good. I mean, uh, we would, and so putting together the live set was basically sitting down with a fag packet and a pencil saying what do we do we'll do this what are the big hits how are we going to go from the biggest uh, question was what are we going to start with and how are we going to get into the second song so once we decided that Bohemian Rhapsody was going to be the opening because it had Fred at the piano and it would bring everybody's attention to it then we said well how much of it are we going to do well we'll do it up to the end of the guitar solo then what and then oh well we could do Radio Gaga I could just go digga 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 and we'll kick Gaga off sold and then everything else just fell into place. So, no more difficult than meetings where you have to finish, you know, on the money, and you don't want people pulling the plug when you're yeah. just coming to the big, you know, the big moment. Um, of course. And so, it was a very uh, workman-like uh, 
setup that we put together. It's just that on the day when we actually got onto the stage, Fred had so much fun messing around with the cameraman. That's a famous scene where he dances with the cameraman. And also, up until that point in the proceedings at Live Aid, it seemed a bit to, to us like a nice sunny afternoon. It was all a bit sort of, a bit of a picnic with music. And it was quite, it wasn't really a rock show until the Queen performance yeah. turned it into a proper rock gig. And instead of being an audience of disparate people, the audience became one. And we thought, we did well, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, it was an incredible performance. I mean, yeah. obviously, as you say... In hindsight, know. they're all saying, oh, my God, it's the iconic performance. We went, well, OK, that's what you think. <laughs> how, how do you think it compared to Wembley? Because there's that well, DVD of Wembley. Well, the thing is that, of, of course... That's then spurred on Wembley because yeah. um, uh, the reaction to the Live Aid performance was became stronger and stronger in hindsight, and then everybody wanted to see Queen again. Yeah. So when they put that, I mean, they recorded uh, the Magic album as the soundtrack to the Highlander movie, um, but but even that was like an extension of what had happened with Live Aid, and the demand to see them uh, went through the roof. Was probably yeah made them more popular than I had been ever before.